Kendall, um, as part of the Fronteras Desk team, won uh, regional and national Murrow Awards for their project, Tracing the Migrant Journey, which traced the experiences of migrants from Honduras through Guatemala and Mexico and into the United States. And before joining KJZZ, Kendall worked at the Nogales International, an award-winning community newspaper right on the border and Kendall was also the first recipient of the U of A School of Journalism Zanger Fellowship. And I got to work with her then. And she graduated in 2016 with a master's degree in journalism. And Kurt Prendergast is also joining us today. Grew up in Ohio and Indiana and came out to Southern Arizona in 2006. Uh, he has a dual degree and master's degree in journalism and a LAS from the U of A, of course, and graduated in 2011. He has researched how border issues evolved um, in the US news media and how local radio stations disseminate news in Bolivia and Argentina. And that's what he did as a master's student. And uh, he has been a reporter also for the Gallus International from 2012 to 2015 covering local border issues, government, community, and business, which set him up very well to uh, his next position at the Arizona Daily Star, where he is now, where he started in 2015, and he's now currently the border reporter there. He covers federal courts, migration, smuggling of drugs, guns, and cash. That sounds like a movie or something. Uh, and asylum seeking families, border wall, migrant deaths in the desert, militias, border uh, cross-border business, political rhetoric about the border and a myriad of other issues. And then uh, last but not least uh, on our panel today, we have Alex DeVoid, and he has been a data journalist at the Arizona Daily Star since June of 2019, where he has reported on the border in various different um, collaborative projects. And he previously wrote about the environment for the Arizona Republic, including stories about public land along the border. Of course, he's a graduate of the University of Arizona and his, uh, for his master's thesis, he built a mobile app prototype for collaboratively mapping issues of border militarization. I have to say that I was on all of these um, amazing journalists now, I, I was on all of their committees. And so it's just really, um, it's, it's great to see how much success you've all had. So we'll get into, let's ask, um, let's get into the questions now. I wonder if you could just start off by um, telling us how you, your professional and academic path, um, how that happened, and maybe a little bit about, a little bit more about your current position. And maybe we can start off with uh, Kendall. Sure, well, hi, it's great to see so many people tuned in here today. Um, yeah, so my path um, to where I am now has been, you know, Celeste described very well. Um, I went back to school to study a master's in journalism. I, I hadn't studied journalism as an undergrad, so uh, that was new to me. And, and while I was there, I started as an intern with the Nogales International, um, then went on full-time after I graduated, uh, which was really the perfect place for me to start my journalism career in a community newspaper where I was able to do a little bit of everything um, and in a community right on the border where there's just so many issues that, that touch other parts of the country and other parts of the border. Um, but to be able to, to tell those stories from a really local angle, I think was extremely helpful. Um, and then I got into radio and now I work for KJZZ, which has been a wonderful shift and a, and a big change now being south of the border in Hermosillo. So here, um, I started here almost three years ago and our desk is technically a business desk, but we do cover a little bit of everything. And exactly as Celeste said, it's, it's really reporting about Sonora and about the borderlands from the south side of the border here on the Arizona-Sonora border specifically. Um, 
and looking for stories that connect to an Arizona audience. And, and I think that is often much more than just stories about migration, which are incredibly important. But you know, we found that people are also really interested in stories about culture and art and um, local issues, whether it's water or, or indigenous issues or women's issues. Um, Obviously we've reported also a lot about the pandemic this year. So yeah, I, I get to do a little bit of everything, but also with that focus on this border region, which has been a wonderful experience. Thanks, Kendall. Uh, Alex, would you like to take, take it from here? Yeah. Um, so like Kendall, I didn't uh, study journalism as an undergrad. And it wasn't until um, I came out to work at a nonprofit in Tucson that I decided I wanted to um, be a journalist. And um, uh, the issues I was learning about on the Arizona Sonoran border really um, resonated with me. And I, I knew I wanted to make it a, a much bigger part of my life. Um, so that's when I. Uh, decided to visit the School of Journalism uh, just to uh, get an idea of of what was you know right in my uh, the town I was living in um, as options to to uh, report on the border because I I didn't even apply to any other schools because um, I knew I wanted to do it uh, you know report on the border and 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 University of Arizona was a, kind of the perfect place to do that um, with Tucson being located where it is and the university as well. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's, that's my, my decision process into uh, making, into, making a decision to be a journalist. And then once I was in it and, um, you know, paying tuition and, and everything, uh, I really wanted to make the most of it, and uh, and there's some great teachers that that help help me um, guide me. And uh, the internship day was was a real um, just a great great thing when I when I got to interview with the Arizona Republic um, and was an environmental fellow with them for a year and a half and then went to the star uh, after that to be a uh, um, data reporter. And I've got, and uh, before that I was actually Kurt's apprentice um, <laughs> at the star. <laughs> so we came back and, and we started working together again. And, and, um, and I got to cover the border, you know, as, as a data reporter with, with Kurt. So, um, so yeah, I, I feel like uh, I was set up well to take advantage of, of the area. That's great. And a perfect segue into Kurt, uh, the most senior journalist here on the panel. Uh, yeah, so um, like I said, I, I grew up in the Midwest and I bounced around a little bit. Uh, I've always been very interested in the international world. I studied international studies as an undergrad. Uh, as an exchange student in Argentina when I was in high school for a year. Uh, and it just kind of, I've always been rolling towards this. Uh, and then coming out to Southern Arizona, um, I got to go, up, you know, walk across the border. You can walk from the, I remember being described to me as the rim of this Anglo empire rubbing up against the rim of the Spanish empire. It's very, it's historical. Um, but it also is just like the experience of going across the border is kind of hard to describe, but you are literally, just taking steps and moving from a one world into the next. The sights change, the sounds change, language change, the whole vibe changes. And that is just endlessly fascinating. Uh, and then there's all the things that go around that. And, you know, as a reporter, you know, having to deal with the way it's talked about versus my personal experience with it is always interesting. Um, but being at the U of A, uh, one of the most valuable things I got out of that was getting to sit down and just read and think and talk about the border and what it means. Uh, and having this like very deep background of reading study after study after study so that no matter what happens and said about the border, I always know that it's not that simple. There is no simple explanation for anything at the border. 
Uh, so that really, I think, prepared me for like the background of being a daily news reporter uh, at the Star. But also uh, working at the Nogales International, right? That is, <laughs> um, I mean, that was just, that was tremendous. Uh, I was, I lived there for like four years. And, uh, you know, I lived right next to the border. I lived next, all my neighbors had relatives who lived in Mexico. It was the most normal thing in the world. You know, they're, uh, you know, school kids grew, you know, bouncing back and forth across the border. It was just super interesting. Uh, and so I do have that kind of perspective of living in a, a, a small town, Nogales, right next to the border, and then moving into uh, uh, the star. Now I have a broader view, um, but I definitely like getting to sit and think about the border for a long time. The experience of living right next to the border for several years, I think, has really you know prepared me to do what I'm doing right now. Thanks, Kurt. I wonder if uh, you touched on it, Kurt, if, if Kendall and Alex, if you could talk about how combining uh, Latin American studies and journalism helped prepare you for what you're doing now. Kendall, you got the straight journalism degree, um, you're in the MA, um, and Alex, you got the dual degree, but you're both, you both had this interest in Latin American studies. Uh, and how those two fit together for what you're doing now or and what you perhaps want to do in the future as well. Yeah, you know, um, similar to both Alex and Kurt, I, I chose the U of A um, and a, applied to the U of A because I wanted that global perspective. And, um, and you know, I think it's even gotten there are even more options now. Uh, but yeah, like so you said, Celeste, my master's was just in journalism. I didn't do the dual master's, but I still got the benefit of that in classes I was able to take and the, you know, other students I was working with and, and obviously professors that were teaching me who, who were in both worlds. And so um, I didn't know that I wanted to continue reporting on the border, but until I started journalism school. I knew I was interested in international reporting. Uh, and then I just stepped into this fascinating world, kind of like Kurt described. It, you know, there, there was just so much that I learned about the border region. I'm from Tucson and grew up close to the border. Uh, and yet there was a lot that I didn't know and didn't think about and that for me was especially impactful having spent so much of my life in the border region and and realizing that there's so much that I never really knew about what was going on around me um so yes the in the border reporting class particularly uh getting that experience of not not only just crossing the border but crossing the border to do reporting and practicing reporting in Spanish and in English. And uh, yes, that, that was extremely helpful. And like Kurt said, so much of the theory as well and some of those, some of the classes that we took that give you that background to understand the context, which is so important in reporting. Because if we don't give the context, then, then often it's, it's not, we're not accurately depicting what's happening. So. Yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't be doing what I am today if I hadn't gone through this program. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kendall. How about for you, Alex? Yeah. Um, so uh, the, my LAS world and my journalism world were uh, very close to each other, but they were very different. Um, and so my... Um, Latin American studies classes were with people who didn't necessarily want to be journalists. Um, and they're all doing, um, I think, lots of different things right now. Um, and it, it was really helpful in those classes, which were kind of round table discussion classes where you did a reading and you came in and you talked about it. Um, and, it and a lot of that discussion helped um, form, help me form and, uh, and sharpen my, my, my perspective and my understanding and, and my, uh, and of the context of the border. 
Um, and, and you know, some simple things I, I've learned that have kind of stuck with me, like um, just when going into a community and uh, that you're not from, um, you know, those discussions I had helped me um, prepare myself to describe and communicate um, stories from those communities. Um, I can't remember the theory behind this thought I'm going to share with you, but one thing that's really stuck with me is that um, we had a discussion about how it wasn't necessarily appropriate to um, compare places in Latin America with what the past. So, um, you know, if, if you go to Cuba, I'm sure a lot of, um, Journal, journalists or, or just, you know, people coming back would, would describe it as, you know, stepping into time, into a time machine and like going back to the fifties or going to another country and, oh, there, there's just, it's like, you know, going back 30 years, there's just so, um, you know, and the connotation is delayed or, or, you know, not up to speed with, with the United States. And so, you know, trying to avoid, so, sitting through these classes, having these discussions tried, um, helped me um, think about how I wanted to um, describe communities that, that I'm not necessarily from. That, that's just one example. Um, but yeah, it, there's a practical tension if you're going to be a journalist um, and you're in journalism school of, of wanting to get clips and always you know, wanting to get something to show editors that you can write. And so, um, you know, it was, it was helpful for me to take a step back and, and go to these LAS classes and, and, and learn about um, other things other than, you know, writing uh, stories and, and getting clips. Um, but, uh, but I think it's a, I think it's a healthy um, tension is, is, to, uh, is to understand some of this theory um, along with the, the practicality and, and the, the very valuable uh, clips that you can generate going through certain programs at, um, with, with a journalism degree. Um, so, yeah. Thanks for that. So now uh, fast forward a bit uh, to what you are all working on now. Maybe you could give us a sense of, uh, you know, how would you describe the, the conditions along the, the border, you know, very kind of inclusive uh, understanding of the border, not just, you know, where the, the international line is, but the border lands writ large. How would you describe the situation now? Because, you know, we, we can kind of, we know how it's being described maybe in, at the national level or, or even regional or local papers, um, uh, news outlets. How would you describe the situation and maybe give us a, a sense of what you're working on now? Maybe start with Kurt. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, uh, from the outside, there is a, a, a crisis at the border. You know, I had that moment a month ago of going through Twitter and seeing a headline and just like, <laughs> all right, <laughs> I guess so. Um, and uh, so and since then, you know, it's come out that there's uh, a lot of people crossing the border right now. Uh, historically speaking, it's still not that many, but, you know, it's more than in the recent past. Um, and it's, you know, living in Tucson, it's not like there are thousands of people all, you know, wandering around the city, wondering where they are. There is like a system in place and they're going to shelters and, and all that. So um, it's not as chaotic uh, in the towns as it might appear to be uh, elsewhere in the country. Um, but there are definitely lots of people coming across the border, lots of families, lots of children. Um, and so I, I got to go into the Casa Lita shelter the other day and it looked very much like 2019 where there was you know, families that just looked like every other family you've ever seen, uh, little kids with stuffed animals and you know, people are getting snacks and you know, a day or two later, they're going to be on a bus to go live with someone, a sponsor, a family, a friend somewhere in the country. Uh, and so that's like what I'm seeing right now. Um, and the task for me is to piece together what's happening 
Uh, there is not a lot of information available officially about why decisions are being made, who's allowed to come across the border, who isn't. Um, there's also, you know, as Kendall talked about, the context is uh, what's happening right now is so, like it's kind of happening at the border, but I don't know necessarily that it's like a like a border story. Uh, it's you know corruption, hurricanes, uh, people are fleeing violence. They're coming up and they're headed to communities throughout the country. There's just a lot of factors involved that are not unfolding at the border uh, that need to be addressed that are kind of outside our purview maybe as uh, border reporters. But also I think it's important for us to at least try to, you know, to, uh, as soon as I can get in and talk to some of these families. Um, uh, when I was there last time, I was only able to just stand in a corner. Um, you talk to them and have them tell me their stories and uh, then, you know, do the research, talk to uh, professors at the University of Arizona who are specialists in this type of thing, uh, who can provide context about why people are showing up, why, what led them to make the decision uh, to leave their homes and come up to the United States. Thanks for that, Kurt. So Kendall, Alex, how would you describe the conditions in the borderlands area? Kendall, you have a, you're south, working south of the border. Uh, maybe start with you and, and then Alex. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think everything that Kurt said is is really important. Um, and along with that, you know, as I think he alluded to as well, is that there is so much conversation about people crossing the border. Uh, and I think one thing south of the border that's really important to talk about is how many people still can't cross the border and are still barred from crossing the border by policies that were put in place under the previous administration, um, specifically, Title 42, um, and also the, the migrant protection protocols that, you know, some people are starting to, to be able to cross under that, but, but there's, there's a, a huge number of people who continue to be in shelters and other living conditions in Nogales and, and all across the border who still don't know you know, are trying to figure out and don't have very much information about how, when they will even have access to, um, you know, the legal process to cross the border. Um, and that has been an issue for now, you know, over a year specifically with Title 42 that people arrive and there's nowhere to go. They aren't even, you know, their names aren't put on a list, a waiting list or, or put into a system, they're just there with no access to any type of asylum or immigration service. Um, and so that, yeah, that's something that I've been doing some reporting about and I think is really important. And as we see this change of administrations, you know, what that has, what has changed and what hasn't. And I, I think that's one of the things that hasn't is that there are still so many people who have nowhere to go, who have, have no idea when they, they will have any kind of change in, in their status and are really stuck in limbo and have been for a year or more for many people. Um, and so that kind of uncertainty and you know, the, the kinds of stresses that creates in people's lives uh, is really important. And I do think, you know, like, like Kurt said, there's a lot of conversation about the crisis. And there are certainly, I think, a lot of things that can be described as crises, but, but so many times that word is used. And I, I think as journalists, we, we know the connotation that comes across when you use that word, which is that the United States is experiencing a crisis of, of people arriving here. And I, I think, you know, like Kurt also mentioned, a lot of that, of what's happening are crises in people's lives where they're coming from and, and where they're currently living in Mexico and south of the border. So that's, yeah, that's sort of the perspective that I've been seeing. Thanks for that, Kendall. And Alex, I wondered what your take is on, on the conditions right now and, and how you as a data, data specialist are trying to, um, you're trying to add a little bit of context. You work with big data and do a lot of different data visualizations. Maybe you can talk about that. Yeah, so I get to talk to Kurt most days. And so I, I ask him what his 
kind of beat reporting is uh, is showing. And the other day, I think I actually asked him. So, Kurt, is is a is there a crisis at the border right now? <laughs> and um, so it's just. Uh, but yeah, my head has been pretty deep into um, uh, death, uh, spatial death data that the um, that the medical examiner's office publishes openly, and so um, we've been uh, looking into that very deeply. And um, so for me, um, the, the crisis, I suppose, at my fingertips has been this really. Um, predictable trend of, of just people dying, um, you know, predictable what, you know, when and, and where. Um, and so uh, that for me, that's, that's been the, you know, in my world of, of that analysis, um, that's been the crisis for me uh, that, that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, so, uh, and then, and then it's you know recently invoked. Uh, uh, Biden, Biden recently invoked it, and um, don't want to steal Kurt's <laughs> an, an upcoming story or anything. But um, it's just it's just interesting to see how little it's mentioned, and then and then when it's mentioned is you is most recently kind of this opportunistic way of saying, you know, lots of people are crossing right now because they have less chance of dying because it's not the summer yet. Um, and so, like, we acknowledge that death happens, um, um, that, that migrants that have, have died um, along the border for years, but um, it, it makes up very little of our uh, priorities on the border in terms of what, why our legislation is being written or, or what problems we're trying to be solved, we're trying to solve. Right, thanks, Alex. I wondered if the, if the three of you could talk about, uh, without throwing too many darts, I guess, think, thinking about national level coverage, you're all working for regional, local uh, news outlets, and you see this, the conditions day to day and the context, you have maybe some deeper understanding. and what the implications are for national level coverage, be it on national television or uh, other news outlets. Um, you know, what are, what are some of the gaps you would say, or yeah, let's just stick with that. What are, what are some of the gaps that, that you would um, like to see filled in terms of news coverage? And uh, yeah, if you were, in on uh, you know a, a New York Times um, meeting of uh, what they're going to cover that week or or any other national outlet. It's not like I'm trying to pick on New York Times or anything like that. But uh, Kendall, you would you like to start off? Sure. Yeah. I guess you know first I would say that I think there is a really robust. Um, network of, of immigration reporters who are doing really good work and who do, you know, know the context and, and write a lot about it. But um, to your point, there, there are a lot of gaps as well. And um, I think from a personal perspective, one thing that's been hard during the, the pandemic is getting out to report. And I, I, you know, I don't know how much that's impacting other people who aren't me, but I felt that personally, and I feel that in my reporting <laughs> in terms of the gaps is that so much um, of what I cover is who, who I have access to from my home. And that's, you know, a, the, a lot of people aren't included in that. Um, and I think for me, that's going to be changing and has slowly been changing, but I think that is part of the gap right now to an extent is that we're a lot of people and, and I include myself in this are talking to organizations and you know talking to advocates um, but talking to people on the ground is is harder you know I think there's always some gaps in that but I think especially now we see that because there is less on the ground reporting um, 
And, and yeah, I think also to the point that Kurt made earlier and, and also to the point of it being harder to get out is that the, these root causes, what are the reasons that people are showing up? I think that does get covered, but I think it needs to be covered much more frequently um, and in, in more depth. And that's not always easy to do. And these are really complicated things, but that that's certainly a really, really important part. Kurt, you wanna take it from here and then Alex? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, so to going off of what Kendall was talking about, um, I, I, it, I, first of all, I think that there, there are more immigration reporters right now than I've seen since I started doing this. Uh, national level coverage is just, it's all, there's a lot of reporters and that's great. Um, in terms of like the, the root causes aspect of it, uh, I feel like there is a gap in coverage where uh, we have like 2019, there is a ton of people come and then it fades. And then now here we are in 2021 and it's like, it's happening again, as they say, right? Um, and it, I think the gap is if we had reporters who were like operating from the perspective that people are living in Mexico and Guatemala and Honduras every single day and they are kind of like interwoven into our lives uh, and our national life. And if we had reporters who were just there and if that became like part of the national conversation was what's going on in Honduras and Guatemala, other than there's a caravan forming or something like that, but just, you know, like just keep us up to date on what's going on there. People are living there every day. Um, and I understand that involves quite a bit of an investment from a newsroom to, you know, place reporters there, but that, that would be wonderful if they could do that. Uh, the second thing is um, after people you know, right now, as we speak, there's a lot of people coming here uh, claiming asylum and they're going to go and they're going to live in Chattanooga and Lansing and Seattle and all over the place. And they're just going to disappear from the conversation. And then we're going to come back in a year or two and we're going to talk about this as if it's a whole big brand new thing. But like they're living there and they're like, what are, what are they doing? What's their life like? Uh, I think you're going to end up with like, there's... <laughs> thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are just like living a life and doing a job and raising kids and like that's what they're doing so that when we have these people coming uh you know to the border we can recognize that they're kind of like you know kind of like us you know just living a life but also like people who came before them they're just people going across and I, there's a million other things that need to be taken into consideration you know rule of law and all of that type of stuff as well but just I would love to have reporting that was like that kind of showed people who were we talking about and like should we be freaked out that there's people coming right now if we have all these people who've come recently and they're just living life and so I feel like that's something that a national publication if they would devote a reporter or two to something would really really inform uh, the, the conversation we have every time that there's something you know erupting at the border. Right, so going beyond the sort of episodic nature of, of the news cycle and uh, how issues are covered when there's a so-called surge or whatever you want to, whatever mm -hmm. word you want to use. Mm -hmm. um, Alex, what would you, would you like to add anything to this discussion uh, in this point? I, yeah, I think Kurt and um, Kendall have really um, added a lot. Um, I, I uh, lived in Nicaragua for a year and a half before I came to Tucson and um, it, and so maybe from that uh, experience, um, I'd love to see stories that kind of get at the nuance that I think Kendall and Kurt were talking about where, um, you know, as, as journalists, we want to explain um, why someone is is fleeing for their life essentially um, and but and then there's a, there's also this nuance of um, you know it's it is possible um, to have you know a wonderful life in a place in in a place like Nicaragua or um, Honduras and so um, 
I think there's this balance between, you know, explaining why individuals make very, um, in very, um, uh, like the right decision for themselves to, to leave under the circumstances that, uh, that they're living in. And, um, but that, you know, opening a conversation to culture and to art and to all of the wonderful things as well uh, about some of the countries that um, people are fleeing um, so that we don't have a, just a, a one uh, kind of a, one angle of looking at, um, at these uh, at certain Latin American countries as, as um, just uh, hellscapes, <laughs> I suppose. But, um, you know, not to, and, and like I said, there's nuance because not to take away from, from the reason the those push factors that, that are, are, you know, very, very real. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's even a hard thing. I think to, I think it can even feel political to, to start to talk about it, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's, uh, that's something I would love to see. Thanks, Alex. I mean, I think what you're getting at it also in a roundabout, well, you've actually, I think um, Kurt might've mentioned it specifically is the importance of news organizations to, uh, to commit resources to this kind of work that you're talking about and how that, um, if they're not committing those resources, it takes a lot of time to do this kind of more in-depth work. That kind of brings me to another question and we'll open it up to questions from the audience here. What are some of the constraints that you're feeling um, not to you know, attack your own news organization, of course, but just like, what are the limitations that you are working under, of course, and then there, we're work, you're working in a pandemic. So that you're feeling right now that are kind of limiting what you would ideally like to be doing. Cause I, I think there's this understanding maybe assumption that journalists, oh, they just don't want to do that. But um, people might not be fully aware of some of the constraints that are uh, limiting some of the things that you would ideally like to do. Uh, Alex, since you're, you're up on my screen and your, uh, your frame is in yellow, why don't we start with you? Um, so just some, what are some of the limitations? Yeah, I guess, you know, if you're in an ideal world, you'd want to cover lots of things, I'm sure, but you've got some constraints under which you're working. So maybe you can talk about that a, a bit and how that influences your ability to, to cover the border. Yeah, uh, well, um, I've, I've essentially been a COVID reporter for the last year. Um, and so I've, I have, um, I, I was working probably much more closely with Kurt um, to do border stories um, before COVID hit, and and so it COVID has just really kind of uh, dominated our resources. I think everyone has been a COVID reporter, um, and there are certainly COVID stories that overlap with the border. Um, in in my um, reporting. It's been pretty heavily, you know, about Arizona. Um, so I, I would say that that really um, the pandemic kind of uh, um, steered me in a in a different direction than where I had envisioned the last year to go. Uh, Kurt and I had, were dreaming up lots of big projects to do, and we were really excited about them. And then all of a sudden, our world just changed and we kind of had a different beat um, all of a sudden. So I, I'd say that's that's been a huge, um, uh, maybe a limitation. It's just a you know shift of priorities for the newsroom and, and, and for the public really that wanted to know what was going on with uh, the pandemic, so. What about for you, Kurt and Kendall? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's the pandemic is just, it's just so hard to see beyond that. Um, I, like, for example, in the months before the pandemic, 
uh, the, the Remain in Mexico Migration Protection Protocols had just been put in place in Nogales. Uh, and so I was going down there like, you know, once or twice a week. And I was just talking to lots of people. And it was it was just like pure reporting. It was amazing. Uh, and I was I, be, I was starting to get recognized as like reporter guy from Arizona. And it was just like it was just it was oh, there's momentum building. It was amazing. And then the pandemic hits. And then I like can't really go there anymore. Um, there's all kinds of stories that I've not been able to do because I just can't go there. Um, uh, and, and so it, it's been extraordinarily frustrating and it's been very limiting. Um, and it's kind of like uh, pushed me to cover more things that are like out in the desert where I'm not crowded with people. So that was, you know, I wrote a lot of stories about the border wall last year. And, you know, that's, I could go out and I don't have to worry about infection and, you know. Um, and then beyond the, the pandemic is like where we are right now is we deal with Customs and Border Protection a lot for border related stories. And their like public affairs protocols are shifting under the Biden administration. Uh, and so we are dealing with like the flow of information has changed a whole lot uh, as like you know, everybody gets acclimated with, you know, their boss and their boss's bosses and so on. Uh, and so that's kind of slowed down the, the information that we're able to get, as, uh, which is not always wonderful anyway. Um, but, you know, that's another thing that's happening is all the, like a lot of the federal officials we deal with are dealing with a new boss and it's kind of slowed down things. So that would be another, uh, uh, you know, other than pandemic limitation I've seen. Thanks for that. How about you, Kendall, working um, in Sonora? Yeah, I mean, I can't um, agree enough with with the limitations that have been felt during the pandemic um, in terms of just leaving the house, but, or, or traveling for me now, I, I'm farther from the border than I used to be. And so to do any reporting on the border is a, a bit of travel, not super far, but, um, and you know, financial considerations have changed because of the pandemic as well. And so we have a lot more limitations on travel, even when we are able to leave the ho the house and, and go out and report. And so, you know, that's from our like my specific news outlet standpoint. Uh, yeah, we we're able to do a little bit, but we've been kind of told, like, you know. Our finances changed this year. It's probably not going, we're probably not going to sign off on the same kind of travel we did pre pandemic. And so, yeah, both be before the pandemic, I also felt like I'd been here a couple of years. I was really feeling some momentum in my feet and, and that all came to a screeching halt. And it's, and it's very slow process in, in reopening um, that back up. But I, I do think one, one thing that I, I enjoy a lot and that I think is less of a limitation for me is that uh, I have a lot of a, like a wide berth in terms of what I'm able to cover. And um, I really like that. And I think sort of to our, our point from before, I, I enjoy covering the border region and I enjoy covering Sonora uh, in a way that that touches on things that are a little bit different about life here um, than what I was able to do before, and, and maybe that I think we see in the news in general. Um, you know, I do cover immigration and business and tourism and some of those things that we see often, but. You know, I, I'm also able to cover really local stories that somehow connect to Tucson or Phoenix, which there are a lot of because so many people have connections across the border. Um, and that that's something that has really been a joy for me and that I feel hopeful and optimistic about despite the limitations that we're all facing. Thanks for that, Kendall. And yeah, I have to reiterate something that you said a little bit earlier and that I really appreciate KJZZ's um, coverage of Sonora because as you all know, you've been in my classes that I talk about the links between Arizona and Sonora and it being really kind of one region 
in many respects, economically, culturally, and uh, historically. So let's see, I'm gonna open it up for questions from those who are in the audience. I, before we do that, I wanted to just mention Ila Abernathy had put in the, the chat here. Thanks to all three for adding nuance and cultural context and respect for cultures and sending countries. Anyone want to join Tucson's uh, tiny Guatemala project in Ichil area in June this year? Rural Ichil and Quiche Maya would welcome you with us. We have a 28 year relationship. So thanks, um, Ila, for putting that in the chat. I don't know if you wanted to add anything else. Just uh, very briefly, I, I might put the video on the not wonderful to look at. Uh, uh, it's, um, it's a tricky time to go. But I think what everybody said is, is very, very important. And the crisis is not at the border. The crisis in, is in the sending countries. And what we have noticed more than anything uh, in Guatemala is just loss of hope over the years. People don't see any way out except sending a relative to the US. It fractures families and country. It creates tremendous strains. Uh, the highly organized uh, criminalized coyote systems that used to be informal, of course, uh, once we started making it so hard to get up, the narcotraficantes decided that this was a good way to make money. So they give a lot of disinformation about what will happen when you get here. They also coach people. Uh, I'm not, and I think there are three things we could do immediately, but if it, and I'm so appreciative of the fact that you folks don't think you can go somewhere for two weeks and know everything. It's just a real blessing. And we really thank you for the reporting and Kurt, I love it that you seem to know something that back when I was teaching freshman comp as a grad student at the UA, you seem to know the difference between a fact and inference and a value judgment. And oh. you very cleverly put the value judgments in the mouths of the people you're talking to. And of course, there's always a bias there because a reporter selects what materials are, go are going to be in the article and he, all and he or she can also make you look really foolish if they quote <laughs> the wrong things that you say. But I'm just really grateful for all of you and to the star as a newspaper for the, the space they've given on this. But uh, uh, please may I join the others and say, don't think of sending countries as these horrible places. Uh, there, there's great vitality and for me, it's a great grief because it's very hard to be a Shil Maya in the United States. And it's very hard to have one son in the States and the rest of the family back in country. And what we're hoping to do this year, other than uh, we're having to put in so many safety protocols in place for their sake, not ours, that it's going to be very tricky. But we hope that the presence, because we've been invited, are, we'll give a little gotita de esperanza, you know, a tiny droplet of hope because what we see more than anything now is lack of hope. And I can think of three immediate things our government should do, but I've talked that, that don't address the major problems of how US policy has created so many of these difficulties and also our rampant consumerism, which gobbles up resources and has added to global warming, which is a major problem in Guatemala. But there are three very immediate things we could do, and I'll save that for some time when I shouldn't take other people's time. Thank you, Ela, for all of that. I, I mean, that's a whole nother panel for sure. Um, at, at least one other, many more panels we can we can talk about the, some of these things that points that you you brought up. Um, I would like to open it up for any other folks in the audience who have questions for our distinguished panelists here. Janine Rally, would you like to jump thank in? You. Yeah, thank you all so much. Thank you for organizing this wonderful panel and all of the great uh, reporters here. Thank you for all your work, amazing work and keeping us informed. Um, just wondering, uh, I don't know if any of you off the top of your head uh, have any uh, feeling for any of the story, the, the reports or 
investigations that you've done over the last years, um, how they may have uh, you felt particularly satisfied in the um, the impact of them, or um, or or if you know if not sort of you're not thinking in that way, um, anything uh, that might um, what could lead to greater impact. Um, and, and that may not be sort of in the sphere of what you're thinking about now, but if you if you are, it'd be great to know about that. Thanks, and thanks for doing this. Go ahead, I'll let you guys answer can, in I, the order you would like. I can start if you guys want. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, with with border reporting is we are kind of located, you know, 2000 miles away from where decisions are made. So uh, we are kind of the impact that we have is just letting people know that certain things are happening. Um, and, uh, you know, there's been it's been a long time since there was a big immigration law that was passed. Um, a lot of stuff is done by executive order and a lot of those executive orders are done by a president who is you know, was elected based on certain promises to do certain things. And so it kind of kind of happens outside of us. Um, but one of the things that happens that actually does seem to have an impact um, is the interplay between local and national reporters. Uh, so there's a lot of like things that we'll report on, like with the border wall, there's a lot of times where, you know, the people who are out, we're out here looking at the wall, you know, and then uh, we describe it and we write it and we're tracking contracts and whatnot. And then that helps inform the national reporters and the national reporters have, uh, you know, their, their sources, high ranking officials and whatnot. And then that helps us do our reporting to understand why things are happening. So, uh, you know, I think like at the local level, local border reporters, that's kind of our most effective impact is that we are including the border in the national reporting dialogue. Yeah. Um, but in terms of policy, I mean, I, 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 would, I would love it if the, our reporting would lead to uh, officials you know, like for example, you know, Alex and I are, you know, working on the project about migrants dying in the desert. And it would be amazing if, you know, the immigration bill would address that more, you know, and if we could do reporting that would help them understand the issue better and, you know, uh, point to sp specific solutions that would help them actually solve the crisis. Uh, and so, but for the most part, it's, we're just trying to like inform, and from my perspective is we're just trying to inform the conversation. Which it, you absolutely are doing. Thank you. Kendall or Alex, would you like to add anything? Sure. I, um, I would just say, I think, you know, how much it happens is, is always uncertain. Um, but I think the impact that I hope for and that my colleague, who you, most, many of you know, Murphy Woodhouse, Karen Sonora hope for, um, in part, you know, aside from maybe changing people's perspectives or, or changing policy is for life and, and Sonora specifically life here to be just a, a, a presence in people's lives. Um, and, you know, we get to have stories about Sonora on the radio in Phoenix almost every day. Um, you know, sometimes they're pretty short stories, but, but for it to be something that people are hearing about and, you know, perhaps become something that they consider to be part of their sphere, um, part of their region, as Celeste was saying, that this is, that their world doesn't end at the border. This is also part of, um, you know, the region that they live in and, and someplace they, they should care about. So, I don't know how much that, in, you know, how much impact that makes, but that's one of the hopes is just that this is some, it, the more frequent exposure to things happening here, you know, just sparks people's interest in, and, and it broadens their perspective about what this place is. I think it absolutely does. Thank you. Alex, did you want to chime in? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> I think Kurt and Kendall uh, really covered that one. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let them, uh, it, with the project Kurt and I are working on, I have the same hopes. So I'll let them uh, answer that one. Thank you. Yeah. And I would just like to add as well, like what Kendall's talking about is very real. 
uh, like like Kendall's reporting and Murphy's reporting uh, down from Hermosillo is filling in the map of Sonora for people in Arizona. It is a much realer place uh, due to their reporting and you know in the minds of uh, about me and people in, in Arizona. There's just a lot of like things that you don't think about, you know. I love reading about the porpoise, you know, but also like fishermen and just kind of like, you know, showing people that this is where people live and there's mm -hmm. lots of interesting, cool, fun things in there. And it's, it's really, really, really valuable, I think. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. I'm glad sure. to hear it. Thanks for that. We have a question in the chat here from Isabel Escogido who asks, uh, do any of you or the publications, radio stations that you work for include stories or news told from the perspective of the citizens of the countries you report on versus telling their story, contra flow. Uh, I can start with that too. Um, go. Yeah, yeah uh, go ahead. Yeah, so, so uh, if this is a getting at your question, uh, you know, as, uh, as soon as I'm able, uh, the, we'll be writing, I will be writing about uh, asylum seeking families. And the thing that will drive that is me talking to them and they will tell me all about their decisions or, you know, I hope that they will. Uh, and that will drive the coverage. So it'll be very much centered on what they're telling me. I'm relaying that to the public, giving context and, you know, and all of that. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's what drives it. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my response. Alex and Kendall, what would you add to that? I, I guess I would say also that that's, I guess, you know, what Kurt is describing is, is the goal for, are my reporting to to come from the, the perspective and and to be based on, you know, the needs and interests and, and um, experiences of people who I'm reporting on. Uh, I, I, you know, yeah, that's definitely, Definitely what I aspire to. Um, same, same here. Uh, with data, it can be uh, the the trick is to balance your time so that you can do your data analysis and um, call people up and just talk to them because that's what we're supposed to do as reporters. Um, so uh, yeah, it's important. It, in my case, I do a lot of data work. It's important to not just let that stand for itself, but to go and, and find um, stories to, uh, to tell from, from others' perspectives. Thanks for that. Other questions? Yeah, I've got a question. And it's a little bit more practical, but I'm interested to know, you know, how much content you produce versus what actually gets published, right? And then what do you see as sort of some of the editorial, you know, decisions that go into what makes the press or makes the airwaves in your case, Kendall? Yep. Uh, Kendall, you want to go first again if you want. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, so if you were to take all of the conversations that I have, all of the reading that I do, uh, all of that for a story, and then what goes into the story, I think that it would be like uh, a very, a lot of times a very small percentage of the information that I gather actually ends up in the story uh, because you're constantly plowing through stuff and it's like, is that relevant? Is that real? That's, you know, and you're just moving through, moving through, moving through. And then when you are, you know, you have a conversation with somebody and that takes, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, and then you end up with like three quotes from them, you know? And it's, so it's a tiny, a tiny, tiny amount. You're like kind of the job of the reporter is to filter everything out. So what is like the most important, most relevant information that the reader needs to understand what's going on? Um, and uh, another aspect of it in terms of like the editorial decision-making is you are trying to like, like, a, you know, begin with the end in mind, you know? And so you're, as you're developing like a story idea, you're trying not to waste anybody's time. And so you're trying to make it like as sharp and as pointed as you can possibly do so that all the work goes right into that. And you don't end up writing a story that has, that your editor is gonna look at and just be like, there's, we don't need half of this, 
right? So you're just constantly, you're just, like the goal is to get it so your editor sees your story and it's just like, that is the best thing I've ever read in my life. That never happens, but that's like the goal. So <laughs> that's my answer. Mm -hmm. How about, let's go with Alex since you are both at the, the star and then we'll go with Kendall on that, on that yeah. question. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I wrote this story about prisons recently. It's not, it's unfortunately not a border story for this conversation, but in my COVID reporting, um, my reporting on COVID, uh, been working with this particular data set that was showing that, um, that there was very little uh, vaccine uptake at the prisons, like very little vaccine distribution to prison, uh, but at one of the highest rates, um, I think it had like the highest uh, uh, rate of cases in the census tract um, it, it, in multiple ways you can look at it. And so I talked to, um, I talked to some, a, a guy who had been formerly incarcerated, he was just let out in February, kind of the perfect um, guy to, uh, to talk about this freely, uh, this topic freely, because he had just gotten out. And he said something um, that just like really struck me. And it was one of the things that was bothering him most about his experience. And that was that um, he said that guards would, um, would threaten to bring COVID in. Like if, a, if an inmate was acting up and they wanted to like exert exposed power over them or, or to get them to fall in line, that would be like some rhetoric they would, they would use to say, oh, I'm gonna, if I get sick, I'm gonna bring it in here so that, so that you get sick too. Um, and you know, that's, that's like a really hard thing to communicate. Cause one, like I can't, I can't really um, uh, fact check that. And so, but it was, it was something that he just kept coming back to that was clearly really bothering him. And so I called up my editor and, and told him about it. And at first I was like, yeah, I, I don't think I can use this because, you know, there's, not, there's no way I can, uh, I can fact check this. And, and then I had, a, so I had a conversation with my editor, went back, talked to the guy, that was, same thing like our conversation eventually made it to this experience he had had. And so I tried to find a way to include it. I ended up including it, um, but I tried to do it from, in a way that would, that would um, let the readers decide for themselves and just lay it out there. Um, so um, I had it, I went even a, a little bit further so, so I said, um, I kind of interjected myself in there a little bit at, at one point and said, you know, it's his voice cut higher um, when he was talking about this as if it was hard, as if he knew it was hard for, hard to believe. Um, ended up taking that sentence out because we decided we didn't need it, but I wanted the reader to, I wanted to, to acknowledge at least for the reader that, yeah, this is a hard, this is like hard thing to, you may not believe this, but it's something that that really bothered him, and you can you can decide for yourself. Anyway, long story short, um, just the best thing to do is be in constant communication with your editor. Um, I when I was first at the Republic, um, I did have a story that um, I I wrote, um, and it just didn't fit with um, I think probably the lens of the paper. Um, and so we never ran it. And the, the key is just to always be in good communication with your, uh, with your editor. Can I, that's great advice to be in communication with your editor. Um, I would just say that when it comes to how much of what, you know, interviews and, and what goes into what actually gets published, had that for me shrunk a lot when I got into radio because our, our longest format is a feature which is four minutes of radio and so you know like Kurt was saying it's it's not uncommon to interview people and for that to last 30 minutes and then you know there may be 20 seconds in 
in a piece of them talking or, you know, a little more, but um, it, it's a real challenge. Um, and in some ways, a good one that has helped me become concise, <laughs> which uh, I think I can always use work on. Um, but it is, it is hard. And one of the things that my editor often says is that especially in radio, you just need to be really specific. You know, what, what a story is about one thing and you can do more stories when you need to broaden it out. But yeah, we definitely, uh, our daily stories that, you know, might run every day on the radio are you know, 40 to 50 seconds. Our features are four minutes you know, maybe 800 words. So there's there's a lot of stuff that goes into a story that never gets published, but just informs me and and hopefully, you know, the idea is to get the best of it and, and parse it down to what will really give the listeners the best sense of that story. Thanks for that, Kendall. We have, um... Ila Abernathy uh, asking, are you aware, maybe this is a question more for Kurt and uh, Alex, given your uh, location and the news uh, outlet that you work with, are you aware that Dan Mills' last day as leader of the Sierra Club Borderlands program is tomorrow? He's been a leader here for years. Do you have any comments? Any stories gonna be on that? <laughs> I don't know. I, I didn't know that he, that was his last day. But uh, Matt, he really has been presence for a long time. You know, anything environmental in Southern Arizona, he's been right at the forefront of it. And with the, the border wall, he was one of the you know, loudest voices, you know, advocating for uh, the animals, wilderness, uh, wildlands, all of that. So uh, I think, you know, thanks for doing all that work. That's great. I don't know if we'll write about it, but uh, yeah, he certainly deserves some respect, some admiration. I wonder if, if they've decided he will take his place already and perhaps that's already been decided. Um, all right, well, let's see, any other questions from folks? I know there are some journalism students here and, uh, and some LAS students. So I'm wondering if it would be appropriate to uh, pull on your sort of expertise as uh, you know successful graduates of MA programs in Latin American studies and and journalism and what uh, you know it's a difficult time being a student right now and a grad student. So what kind of advice would you have for students to you know finish and be successful with their degrees and and moving into the profession if that's what they're planning to do. Kurt, go for it. <laughs> um, um, I think that my uh, perspective on it will be much different um, in a couple months. Once like the vaccines have been, you know, there's a lot, the, the world has been vaccinated or the country has been vaccinated. Um, <laughs> in terms of the journalism world, uh, it's kind of like, it's always been kind of grim outlook for jobs, uh, but there's also people continue to work and get hired. So I wouldn't be totally discouraged by the news that the, you know, that the news business is imploding. <laughs> um, there are, I, if I were, I guess maybe this is the best way to say it. If I were starting out right now, I would head towards the uh, the local independent uh, news outlets, the small startups that are just all over the country. Those people are going to be hungry for talent. They're also going to be hungry to hire people who don't uh, need to get paid uh, a whole lot. Uh, so like entry level reporters, I think you, there's probably a lot of different uh, uh, news outlets out there that would hire you. Uh, it won't be the New York Times probably, but it will be like very useful and in your first couple of years out, I think the whole goal is to survive it and write a thousand stories and just get into it and just get over all, make all your, your little mistakes, get over all the, you know, as, as much as you can get over your uh, anxieties and insecurities and just push through. And, uh, you know, that's what I would, uh, that's what I would suggest. Go look for the local outlets. If that gets at the, 
that's a question. I'm not sure. It does. It does. Thanks, Kurt. What about you, Kendall and Alex? I mean, I, as a, a fellow NI alum from the Nogales International, that I can I can agree with that. I, I think just being able to dive in to a local community newspaper or, or you know radio or what, whatever it might be. Um, it is incredibly valuable. You, you learn a lot, it's a lot of hard work, um, but it definitely, it definitely helped me hone my, my journalism skills greatly. Uh, and then the other thing I would say to students is that I think when I was a student, I mean, I was very intimidated by other reporters. <laughs> Maybe that's just me, but I would say that what I have learned and I think is incredibly valuable is that reporters for the most part are really open and would love to talk to you and, and help you out and, you know, see you on your way into getting into this profession. Um, and so, you know, don't be afraid to reach out or, or to, to be in, in touch with reporters and to ask for advice. You know, we're, we want to see more good reporters coming into the field. So we'd love to help, help out with that. So any of you, if a student contacts you, they're, they're welcome to contact you. Yes. Yep. I get it. I get it. Yeah, great. <laughs> I see the thumbs up. Alex, advice. Yeah. Um, if, okay, I'm not muted. Good. Um, if you want to be in journalism, try to get as many clips as you can. Um, prioritize it. Also, if you want to write... If you want to do a certain type of journalism, start doing it now. Um, I feel like um, maybe I've been lucky, but I feel like I've I've gravitated to a certain type of journalism, and so those are just what my clips are. So no one was going to hire me for anything else. Um, so if you can if you can focus on what you want to do now, and you can get clips to show that you can do it, you know that that you can start paving your own path. Um, but, uh, you know, really prioritizes uh, writing, just get it, getting into the habit of, um, of, of uh, being in that uncomfortable, maybe situation of having to finish a story and, um, and going through the process. Geez, I feel like I have a lot of, <laughs> I feel like I could give other advice, but um, the yeah, that's what sticks out right now is um, just really focus on what you're you're passionate about now. Um, and if you don't like doing something, maybe don't do it and and show people that you can do what you what you're passionate about. Thanks for that, Alex. Well, we're coming to the end of the the time here for our panel. Um, this has been fantastic. Thank you for putting that in, in the chat, Janine. Any other questions? Now's the time to ask of all these, these great guests your burning question. Yes, Alisa, please go ahead. This is not a question, but I just wanted to thank the, um, everyone for the good reporting, um, reporting on the underserved and those who don't have a voice and giving them a voice and trying to change the system. Thank you for that comment. I appreciate it. Anybody want to respond to that? Oh, well, thank you. That's very kind of you to say. Uh, hopefully, like reporting is about, uh, you know, the people who need reporting, who are overlooked and don't have voices. And hopefully, we are out there bringing them into the conversation and making sure people understand their situation. That that's a that's a big goal. I hope that we are accomplishing it. All right. Well, I. 
let's see, Colin uh, put in a chat. Um, thanks so much to the panelists. Yes, definitely appreciate your time and insights and we'll continue to follow your work and maybe have you back again at some point. Does somebody have their hand up? Yeah. I had one quick question with an, uh, it's a quick question with a long answer. So I don't know whether anybody can challenge it or not, but a lot of the really horrific things that have been going on on the border in terms of walls and environmental consequences that lead to others uh, exist because of Section 102 of the Real ID Act of uh, 2005. When are you guys going to start reporting on that? It needs to be uh, revised. Gary, you talking about the waivers? What? Gary, you talking about the waivers? No, the, the uh, yeah, the waivers and the fact that the, a political appointee, the head of Homeland Security can override somewhere between 45 and 84 duly approved and constituted laws just by the stroke of a pen. And nobody should have that much power. I don't care what party they're in mm -hmm. or how good their heart is or how evil it is. Mm -hmm. So can, how can we light a fire under Congress on that one? You reporters who have a bigger audience than some of us. Uh, I mean, that certainly was uh, kind of a bizarre aspect of uh, reporting on the border wall construction uh, was that I think people have in their minds that there is like a thing that happens and another thing happens and so on that the, the government would say, hey, we wanna do this big project. And then it'd be like, okay, all right, now someone's gonna go in and they're gonna like, uh, beyond just like present a plan to the public, which didn't happen until months later, but like, uh, yeah, what's the impact of this project gonna be? What are the things that we need to worry about? Have you thought about this, that, and the other impact on water, uh, contamination and all of that? And so it, they just didn't do it and they just skipped over it and they you know it's like you're talking about uh you know these duly enacted laws that they just step they sidestepped um and it's tricky because there was a law that allowed them to sidestep the other laws um but it also was very very indicative of the process as a whole that it was just kind of like thrown together and they were just like they decided that we're going to do this and they just started doing it um, I think that there should have been more of a backlash uh, uh, among, you know, Congress members. Uh, I think that they should have been like, hey, these are laws that we enacted and you didn't, you've decided that you're not going to follow them. Uh, as, as like, I think that we, nine out of 10 or 99 out of 100 border uh, wall stories had that line in there about them, you know, the, the, the waivers to all the laws, but it wasn't really like it had very little impact. Um, you know, the putting it that in the reporting, I think it, like looking back, I wish I would have gone and written uh, more in depth about that, at least like have one really, really good story about it and then be able to like refer to that like in depth reporting as it went along. Um, but it, it was interesting, like the, the spirit of the endeavor was so like uncaring for what the, you know, democratic process or what we envision that to be. It just, they just went steamrolled everything, which is, I think is what the base wanted. Uh, so, but any, anyway, so yeah, so I, I think it would have been great if I would have written more about it. I should have done that. You still can. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. If they start this, yeah. Uh -huh. Kendall and Alex, I, would either of you want to add anything? I, I would just say, yeah, I agree. I, you know, I've done some stories about impacts south of the border um, from the wall and have, again, mentioned that as sort of a line in there, but as Kurt said it, and, and you're saying, Hila, certainly is, is worthy of, of, of attention. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, I think the star, um, I probably wouldn't be the one to write that story, but at, at the Republic, I did write about, um, you're gonna hear my uh, wife sing or trying to get this the baby to sleep. But um, so uh, I, I wrote about, uh, I think what Dan Millis called renegade roads. Um, and those are just how, those are 
when a uh, border patrol can can drive through uh, um, designated wilderness, basically uh, anywhere um, in in certain areas that, that they want um, to complete uh, certain tasks of their job. So there's a pretty extensive story about that, which is sort of related. Um, uh, that that I did a couple of years ago, but but I I would agree it's it, it was one that I think um, that could have been a good uh, a big um, explainer a while ago. Thanks for the suggestion, mm -hmm. and still could be. Yeah, yeah. There's there's still an opportunity. That's right. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists for tremendous, uh, you know, sharing your time and your experience with all of this, uh, with all of us here um, on behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies and the Center for Border and Global Journalism. This concludes this part of the this panel, but we will be having another panel coming up on April 22nd, let me share my screen so I can give you a little bit of sense of what's coming up. Uh, we have another panel with uh, some esteemed alumni who will be talking about digital storytelling in unprecedented times. So if you are, if you liked this discussion, you you'll definitely want to come and join us for this other discussion. Stay tuned, we'll be providing you more details with the Zoom links and everything else, how to join the conversation. So thank you very much everyone for being here. Thank you, Colin uh, and Clara for also helping to organize and uh, get this panel together. Everyone have a great evening.